Greetings and welcome to another edition of The Pedal Ship Project. The Pedal Ship Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle, from tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride. Let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are available at pedalshift.net slash 262, and you can email the show at pedalshift at pedalshift.net or text me at 202-930-1109 and check Pedal Shift out on all the socials as well. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 262nd edition of the Pedal Shift Project. My name's Tim Mooney. Thanks so much for joining. It is, it's starting to chill down. It's starting to get darker outside. We are in full-fledged fall mode around here. I've got, uh, let's see, I've got one more good ride in me before the end of the year. I will talk more about that when the time comes. Uh, it's kind of a continuation of that wackadoodle tour that we just got done telling the story of. But for the next couple of weeks, I want to uh, do something that I should have done, really frankly, a long time ago. And that is to do a more robust audio guide to cycling the C&O Canal towpath. And the origin of this is actually kind of funny. Uh, I'm an occasional lurker on Reddit, and one of the places that I lurk upon is the bicycle touring subreddits and the bikepacking subreddits. Um, and I just recently saw a question of somebody asking about uh, general questions about the C&O, and I found myself just tap, tap, tapping away and ended up writing a semi a semi-novella-length <laughs> post, which was relatively well-received, I thought. So uh, I did realize that at that point that I never, despite talking about the C&O towpath all the time on this show, I mean, I've taken you all on so many different tours on that, I, I it's been a little bit of a slapdash uh, bit of content for you because I've never kind of put it all into one place. My thoughts on it, uh, the roots, the surface, all of that, I, I've probably mentioned it a million times. But I've never put it all into one place. So I thought that for the next couple of weeks here in November, as I'm sitting here recording, that we would uh, do that and that I would give uh, basically a two-part guide to bicycling, the, the, the Chesapeake and Ohio National Historic Park towpath. Here in part one, I'm going to be talking about kind of the basics, and I, I just kind of tapped out a whole bunch of FAQs as a way of answering the kinds of questions that people I have typically found um, that they ask all the time, whether these are folks who are total noobs, total beginners at bicycle touring, or they're into bicycle touring, but they've never done this particular trail before. It's kind of gotten popular over the years. Um, I always thought that it was something that I was surprised that it wasn't used as much as I expected. Um, and, and I probably have talked about that through a variety of the different tour journals over time. But I, I do think part of it is because it, there seems to be a bit of a slapdash amount of information. There's tons out there. I'm going to mention a few of the resources that, that I have relied on in the past uh, here at the top of the show, uh, mainly because I'm going to be liberally citing them in, in some of the answers to the stuff here. Um, and, and we'll just go along that. The uh, first thing that I want to talk about is the route and the length. And uh, from that, I'm going to be liberally borrowing from the Bike Washington uh, C&O Canal Bicycling Guide that is, can be found at bikewashington.org. This was the most important resource for me uh, I, amongst any resource that is out there on the C&O, and, and it still stands the test of time. It do, I do not think that it's being updated in a robust way. It, it, it is being updated in the mile marker, the mile by mile section um, over time, probably better than mine is, but that is that is a topic for another time. But I would definitely recommend checking that out as well. So uh, basics, root and length. As Bike Washington says, the 100, 184 and a half mile long Chesapeake and Ohio Canal is located along the north bank of the Potomac River, starting in Washington, D.C. and ending in Cumberland, Maryland. The canal this continues uh, was built between 1828 and 1850, and it operated sporadically between floods until 1924. In 1954, U.S. Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas organized an eight-day hike up the canal's towpath in an effort to save it from being converted to a parkway. His efforts succeeded, and in 1971, the canal became a National Historic Park. 
That's a little bit on the kind of the root and the length of the brief history. One thing that I want to add in there is it cannot be overstated how important Justice Douglas was in in advocating for that bit of wild land and how things would have been very different in D.C. had that parkway been put in. Had that been put in, um, we would have lost out, obviously, on a major bit of of you know, wildlife and, and history and all of the things that the towpath brings to us. But by putting that parkway in, I think that what it would have done is that it would have made traffic in and all sorts of different elements of car culture in D.C. that much worse. And I think that um, as with all roads, we get the, the induced demand thing, if you want to geek out on on uh, transportation uh, math and things like that look up google induced demand and you would find that um a road like that would have just been a really disastrous thing for dc it would have transformed georgetown in a really negative way and it certainly wouldn't have added much to us here in the district of columbia so i am internally grateful to justice douglas for his advocacy on that uh, another famous person who uh, famously walked hiked the entire length of the towpath was robert f kennedy he uh, did that famously back in i believe uh, during when he was attorney general so not terribly long after the famous uh, william douglas uh, justice douglas hike um and uh, but before of course he was assassinated so you know in 1971 is when we mark the beginning of it by the way 1971 we're past the 50th year i didn't even realize this uh it was born the same year i was and i turned 50 this year so happy birthday happy fi- big 50 to the chesapeake and ohio national historic park um Let's talk a little bit about, and by the way, there's tons of more resources out there for you if you want to really get into the history of this. In addition to that bit of history, of course, the geography of the area, this goes through some really fascinating uh, areas of the world. Um, it, it the, the history of it starting off as a canal that was basically the idea of George Washington to transport goods and services to try to get basically the raw materials from the Ohio area, basically the Midwest, what we now know as the Midwest, to the East Coast and the manufacturing centers and, and whatnot. It, huge, huge, cannot be overstated how important that was. But there, so there's that. There's also um, the elements of the Civil War. This towpath goes through a ton of places where there were big civil war battles and uh you know that you you can fill documentaries and books all about those types of things as well one of the interesting things that i recently have seen i believe on reddit and i wish i could cite the particular person who had mentioned it that uh this has to do with something about the the, the quote unquote right direction to go um interestingly the the suggestion was that going from dc uh, uh upstream was the proper way to go because as you sort of move in time and especially if you continue and and add on the great allegheny passage to it and go all the way to pittsburgh that there is a march through history that you start off with sort of you know um the the oldest uh elements of the country starting off in dc and working our way through and the the whole concept of having uh um raw materials and the canal itself and that's importance and as you keep going on then you go into the civil war era of our country by going through some of the battlefield areas and then as you continue on you're into cumberland and into your into the west and then you start to do this transition from towns that are um, were hit economically uh following the great era of all of uh the the uh our industrial era and you end up in Pittsburgh. And in Pittsburgh, of course, you know, not only did Pittsburgh see the fall of being a post-industrialized city, but then the rise of it being basically based in healthcare and information technology and things like that. And so it's a really fascinating trip almost linearly through the history of the United States. So if you are coming, whether you're a history buff within the U.S. or you're coming from outside of the U.S. and want to kind of experience it in that way – Riding along the CNO is certainly something that can uh, bring you a lot of that, which I think is kind of cool. Let's talk a little bit more in terms of basics on the surface of the CNO. I am here to tell you, and you have heard on prior episodes of this show, that there could be reams of materials written on the surface of the towpath. In the original, I would say since 1971 at least, let's, let's just go back to there. 
Because this was a National Historic Park, the Park Service, I think, always wanted to try to maintain the historic nature of the towpath. Before the Park Service took over and before the uh, uh, the famous hikes, or during the famous hikes perhaps by uh, Justice Douglas, the towpath was completely trashed, um, overgrown. The canal was filled in. The canal is still filled in in parts with, with trees and brush and whatnot. But the towpath was really trashed. When the National Historic Park status got assigned to it and money came in. I think that the Park Service wanted to make it so that it was like it was during its its heyday, if you will, as a transportation option where essentially uh, uh, animals would pull barges uh, from the towpath. They would be on the towpath. The barges would be in the water. And they wanted to have the conditions to be similar to that. That is great for donkeys and for pack animals and for uh, horse-bound people, people on horses, uh, but not so great for cycling or maybe even hiking. So um, over the years, there has been a real sea change. Really, in the time since I started podcasting, I think that this has changed. We have seen the surface go from basically a crushed limestone um, and really an untreated uh, dirt path for most of the path to a more modern surface in parts between uh, about mile marker 30 to 35 or so and to mile marker 75 or so, give or take. And this is always changing. We're starting to see the towpath and the park service move from the what I like to call the historic surface, which can get really muddy and really nasty and can be rutted, have lots of puddles in it, to this more modern surface, which is akin to the Great Allegheny Passage, which is thick and drains well and just is fantastic for cycling on and hiking and all the other purposes that you might want to do. In fact, they actually actively discourage uh, folks who ride horses from going on the surface because they can in rut it up pretty well. So I would say that the surface is undergoing uh, probably a decade-long changeover. Will all of it be completely moved over? Probably not, because I think there are sections of this towpath that are too prone to flooding on a frequent basis that I doubt that they would want to do anything that uh, couldn't be washed away in those sections. There's also, of course, some sections, some of which are actually closed, as I said here right now, around big slack water in that whole area, where there sometimes is some additional damage, and then there are some detours that happen around those parts as well. Um, of course, there's also the uh, the tunnel as well, which uh, is the Pawpaw Tunnel that's currently undergoing some descaling nearby it. So it's closed and you can't go through that particular section as well. I doubt that they will end up resurfacing the tunnel itself, but you never know. Could be wrong. It could probably stand up, to be quite honest and blunt. So the surface, I would say, is something that you're going to be dealing with. I find it to be a bonus. I like the fact that it's not the same surface all the way through. I like the fact that it's got some quirks to it. I like the fact that it's challenging at times. For those of you who are more into bikepacking and are used to going on some single track, well, this is this is not single track, except in really terrible parts of it. But, you know, it is much more akin to the types of surfaces that you're used to doing and then much better than that. For those of you who are used to paved trails, um, this is going to be harder for you, probably. Um, uh, if you catch the weather in a good way, you may not even notice it. If you catch the weather in a bad way, uh, you could end up struggling through it. So it just depends on what you're willing to put up with. I like that it's got a personality. I think I've said on the pod before, I love the CNO. Sometimes the CNO does not love me back, <laughs> and that's okay. Last but not least on the basics, weather. The Atlant the Mid-Atlantic, where uh, I live, uh, I live, as many of you know, in a couple of different places. I live in Washington, D.C., where I'm sitting right now, and I also live out in West Virginia, very close to where the towpath is on the West Virginia side of the Potomac. I'm on the southern side or the southern bank of it. Uh, so this, the, the towpath is on the other side, on the Maryland side. Weather around here is super variable. Um, I think every place in the world has the old joke of, if you don't like the weather here, wait five minutes, it'll change, or some variation on that. Certainly true around here too. But let's talk about the different types of seasons just really briefly. I think we'll get into that uh, when we are going into um, uh, the FAQs in a couple of minutes here. But uh, the 
we'll start off with the, oh, let's start off with the winter. Well, the winters can be cold. Um, we typically do not get very far down, uh, below, uh, let's say the teens in the, in the winter. If we're talking January, February, it is entirely possible that it could be colder than that. It's just unusual. Um, so if you are coming from the upper Midwest, and you're used to lows uh, in the single digits or below zero, it's incredibly rare that we would get that during in any of the stretches of the C&O. It's much more likely that it would be hovering somewhere below freezing. Highs uh, will be somewhere around freezing or above, just depends on what part of the winter. Do we get snow? Yes, but lately, climate change, hello, not as much. Um, it will come, though, there, that we are known for getting nor'easters potentially that far down the towpath. It's possible, but it's, again, less likely that you'll be facing too much in the way of snow. Ice, definitely going to be a thing in the winter. Spring, one of the better times to go. The the, the towpath sometimes takes a while to dry out from a long winter, so early spring may not be as good as later in the spring, but I'll tell you my favorite season in this region is probably somewhere between mid-April and mid-May. Um, flowers are out, you're starting to get leaves, it's starting to get warm, but it's still pretty cool. It's an excellent time to consider doing the, the, the towpath. Rain, possible, uh, always possible, but uh, uh, our, our, our springs can sometimes be a little bit on the wet side, but it's really variable. I would say if you're worried about, if you don't want to ride in the rain, this is not a good region to go to because I think that there's a chance of rain on any given time during the year. Summer is probably the most po uh, popular time that people come. Uh, here's the thing about the summer. I've talked about this a million times. It's hot. It gets hot here, real hot and muggy. Um, the old joke of DC being a, uh, being built on a swamp, actually true, physically true. And much of the area where you're going to be is in areas that are uh, quasi wetlands as well. I mean, and frankly, the towpath itself is along uh, a canal that is sometimes really more swamp than it is uh, anything else. So muggy, hot um, mosquitoes sometimes, um, gnats all the time. It's It can be an issue. And if you don't like bicycling in heat, I would not recommend the summers. Um, lots of people do it. It's the most popular time to come. You get great daylight. It's pretty fantastic. I still do it. Don't love the summer. <laughs> Fall, probably the best time to come. Uh, we get beautiful foliage. If you catch the in the right time in September, you get the uh, pawpaw fruits, that, which ripen along the trail. Weird fruit, tastes like a cross between a banana and a mango, and I'm not kidding. And you kind of like scrape the fruit off of the seeds. It's super weird. It's the most bizarre thing I've ever had, but worth doing if you're riding in September and they are in season. And of course, like I said, the foliage is just incredible. Temperatures are great. Things don't really start to get cold and even even just a little bit cold until sometime in mid-November or so. You, you're going to catch 70 degree days for highs, but you may also catch highs in the 40s or 50s too. It's a really variable transition time. And that's the fall. And then you get into the winter. I would say that you can really ride well into December on the CNO. Um, and it's perfectly fine. We generally don't get snow in this region until January and February. Just meteorologically, that's just how it is. So if you're trying to avoid snow, but you don't mind a little bit of cold, December is actually not bad. Downside, not a lot of light. So that's the weather for the four seasons. Of course, your mileage may vary, and we have very variable weather conditions. All right, so I want to spend the last part of this first part of the show, or excuse me, of the, the guide, running through some FAQs. Um, these are not the only questions that I ever get, but I think they're kind of common. Um, they came a little bit off the top of my head. They came from uh, some Reddit questions that I noticed and from a variety of other sources as well. So frequently asked question number one. Do I need big tires? <laughs> um, this is, I, I have seen some bad advice out there that says, you need to have knobby wide tires. And if you don't have knobby wide tires, you are going to suffer. Well, no. I've seen people on skinny tires on basically road bikes do just fine. Now, if you catch some bad luck and you end up with wet weather and you're on some of the, um, historic surface portions of the CNO and you're on skinny tires, you're going to suffer a little bit. You are. Um, I ride on um, uh, reasonable width tires. I, I think I'm on, what am I on? 40 millimeters now? I think so. Um, 
And I think that those just work out great. Do you have to worry about flats? I would say there's always the chance of a pinch flat um, on a variety of det- – there's some transition surfaces uh, between bridges and things like that where a pinch flat is definitely possible if you're not inflated properly. But I would say that the odds of you getting a flat on the C&O are probably a little bit lower than if you're on asphalt going over places where you could get nails and things like that. Does that mean don't bring a patch kit and things like that? Well, as many a person who listens to this right now who's had a flat on the CNO will attest to you, no, bring those. But do you need bulletproof tires and knobby, wide mountain bike, full suspension? No, absolutely not. The bike that you have probably can be used to ride on the CNO. A few things that I would recommend. Don't go full skinny tire. Try to try to get a reasonable width tire. You don't have to go overboard with it. it doesn't have to be some mountain bike tire or something like that. It, 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 any kind of reasonable width is probably pretty good if you go past like the kind of the the road bike skinny tire. Um, I would also recommend uh, having some way of keeping the mud off of you and your gear. Fenders is the way that I do it. Folks have all sorts of different ways of doing it. They have temporary fenders and things like that. I ride with fenders all the time. I'm on record of that. Um, But those are the types of things that I would recommend for you from a tire perspective. Suspension, all of that, do you need that? No, you don't. If you like it and you want it, go for it. It's totally fine. Um, that's, That's the basics on tires and gear in that area. Another FAQ, how many hills are there? The answer is it's not zero. You're going to read a whole bunch of people who say it is board flat the whole way through. That is mostly true, but there are some sections where actually you are going to have these many little downhills in a few of the sections, generally um, much further towards the Cumberland area rather than towards D.C. In the D.C. area, it is indeed mostly flat, but there are some small portions of the CNO where there are teeny tiny little hills. And you need to be prepared for that, um, especially if you start going down them and let's say you're pulling a trailer or something like that. That's something that you – it's a bit of a surprise for some people when they come upon it. I believe it's by Dam 5 is one area where it's like that, and that can be, that, that, that can be problematic if you're, if, you're not, uh, uh, if you're not able to uh, adjust for that, if you're, not, if you're not looking out for it. Because there are some sections, even by um, some of the uh, the cabins that the Park Service has, closer to D.C., there's actually some small downhill sections. Does that – when most people ask the question about hills, though, they're talking about really big long hills or really big steep hills. No, we don't have those on the CNO. What's the best direction? Man, I, I'm surprised I didn't put this first because people ask this all time the time. They ask it in the context of the larger GAPCO, if they're doing um, Pittsburgh, D.C. or vice versa. Um, They talk about this from the uh, perspective of doing it just from Cumberland to D.C. or vice versa. There is no best direction. The best direction is the one that you want to do the most. I talked about the historic nature, where you can make the argument that the history flow is from D.C. to Cumberland. But that might not be necessarily compelling for you. If your transportation situation is easier for you to start in Cumberland and come to D.C., do that. If it's from D.C. to Cumberland, do that. Um, I don't think that there is a bad way to go. Uh, I think I have different opinions when it comes to the gap, and I tend to be a contrarian on that. And we can talk about that in another audio guide. By the way, if you would like me to do the same treatment for the Great Allegheny Passage, I would be happy to do that. I just thought I would start with the C&O right now. So direction, I would say there is no best direction. Go with what works best for your beginning and end of tour needs. What is the best time of year? Well, I kind of already said that. The best time of year is whenever you want to go. I think this is a four-season trail, but winter is probably the most challenging and the most desolate. Um, You're also going to have fewer services then. The best time, I think, is the fall, followed by the spring, and then I'll put summer dead last, but that's just me. (laughs) Some people love the heat, love the humidity, love all the extra sunlight you get. That's just my particular um, opinion. You may run into thunderstorms and a whole bunch of other reasons why the summer may not work for you, or it may work for you best. Go when you want and when you have time for it. Camping. Where do you camp? Well, as it turns out, there is a ton of free camping all up and down the C&O. 
And I have uh, put out uh, several years ago, I did videos of every single one of the free hiker biker campsites all along there. It's 30 plus of them. They are not the only places where you can camp, but they're probably the best ones because they are Ta-da! Free. They also come with a porta potty. They also come with uh, a water pump during the on season. So that's going to be sometime in the spring through sometime in the fall. It's variable when the park service removes the handles. When you don't have the water, you can still camp there. It's still open. You just have to figure out a different way to figure out your water situation. I'll talk about that more in another FAQ. But um, there are some paid campsites. And some other options for camping as well. Um, can you wild camp on there? It is uh, actively discouraged. The Park Service would tell you absolutely not. Um, I would say there's no good reason to wild camp on the CNO unless for some reason you find it compelling. Um, just bear in mind that you are definitely acting outside of what the Park Service is asking you to do and that you're probably within a mile or two or so, um, no more than probably five to ten of a actual campsite with some actual amenities. So you probably should consider that first. Next question. I don't want to camp. Can I do this ride? The answer is, of course you can. There are a ton of opportunities for roofed lodging for you all throughout the trail towns. Um, that has improved in recent years. It used to be that it was a, there wasn't really much in terms of services between Cumberland and Hancock for roofed lodging. That's really changed. Pawpaw has come up uh, and has a, a good game there. There's a, a, a pretty well-regarded based on uh, the feedback I've gotten from riders on the trail. For uh, one gentleman's uh, uh, kind of like a B and B type of setup, there um, he's got multiple multiple houses, multiple tiny homes, if I, if I recall correctly. So tons of opportunities through all of the trail towns. If you like to do what I end up recommending, and I could talk about this probably more in the next episode when we do the the uh, uh, the sections uh, chunk by chunk. If you like to do this in uh, three sixty mile chunks, roughly, uh, there are great stopping points. units. DC. And then there's the Harpers Ferry slash Brunswick area, and then you've got Hancock, and then you've got Cumberland. So you've got just great places to begin and end um, all along there. Great towns. They all have lodging uh, for you if you don't want to camp. Now, if you're like me, you like camping, you can camp all along, as I mentioned before, or you can mix and match. So all up to you. Next question, where do I eat? The answer is wherever the heck you want. Um, you can haul food with you and be exclusively self-contained. I did that during COVID uh, because I, it either wasn't ever available or I wasn't comfortable going to places to get food. But you can also stop in all of the trail towns so that you don't have to go terribly far off of the trail to be able to get food. It's much better further down the trail from D.C., than it is closer to DC. In fact, I would I would say that once you get past Brunswick, which is around mile marker 50 or so, 55 actually, coming in, there are very few areas. There's Point of Rocks, which is not terribly far from there, but there aren't as many places to get food immediately off the trail. You have to go a little bit further away. So I would say you want to plan to have more food with you for those areas, basically until around uh, mile marker 45 or so, with a couple of exceptions, uh, which I can talk about in the, uh, the section discussion next time. But tons of places to eat. I really, I have my own favorites and, uh, you know, you can get on Reddit and you can get uh, suggestions from all sorts of people. But I always say carry some food with you as well. I think it's really important. Picnic tables at every single campsite. So you've got a good place where you can kind of take a break and have a good breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever you want. Second breakfast, third lunch, whatever, <laughs> all along the way. Water bottles. Where can I fill them up? The answer is a couple of different ways. There is going to be opportunity to get uh, tap water, city water in any of the variety of trail towns. You could buy bottled water or, you know, your Gatorades, your sport drinks or whatever, and fill, fill up your water bottles that way in any of those towns. But there is also the extra special thing along every single one of the campsites during season. There are uh, water pumps or wells. Uh, where you can fill up your water bottles. Incredibly important during the summer. I'm here to tell you, you go through so much water, you won't even you won't even realize it. Um, it does have it is uh, uh, it, 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 they use iodine to 
to make sure that there aren't any uh, cre- creepy crawlies in that. And that is a really important thing for, for uh, making sure that you stay healthy, but it does leave a bit of a taste. If you don't like that taste, you can, of course, flavor your water. There is also some um, filtration that you can do to get out the iodine flavor as well. Or you can do what I do. I bring a water pump and uh, or a, a filtration system. Sawyer squeeze, and I use that. I sometimes will use Potomac water. Now, I do not recommend that in certain areas. There are some outflows uh, of of municipal waste that goes into the river, and you don't want to be drinking that, even if you are filtering it. So, be mindful of all of that. Filters are really helpful as kind of a last resort, from my perspective, because water is pretty easy to get uh, along the trail. Next question: What is the wildlife situation? Well, it's pretty. Pretty, pretty good. Um, I, usually people ask that question wanting to know whether or not there are bear issues or raccoon issues or thing, wildlife that will mess with your ability to enjoy your time. Here's what I'll, have, I'll say about that. I have never seen anybody uh, throw up a bear bag for their food. I have never seen a bear on the CNO. I have heard of it. But it's not, uh, it's not such a situation that even the Park Service doesn't put out any kind of warnings or notices about bear uh, along the CNO. And part of that is because where the CNO goes is really kind of away from the mountains and hills where you're going to tend to see bear. I think that there are some exceptions to that, probably in the pawpaw area. But generally speaking, you're not going to run into that being a problem. Now, there are you don't have to go too much further away from the trail to have the possibility of bear being there. But as far as having to protect your food in the same way as a backcountry situation, generally it's not being, it's not required of you. I've never seen it. I've never done it. So not something you have to worry about. Raccoons, I've heard of them. I've heard of them raiding people. I bring all of my stuff inside the tent that a raccoon would potentially want. Now, would you want to do that if there are bear in the area? No, you would not want to do that. You would want to use a bear bag. So just be mindful of of the fact that some of the things that you are used to doing in more wild areas may not be as necessary along the CNO. That could be good. That could be bad. Just keep your ears open. Know whether or not there's been any changes to those situations because you never know what can happen through the years that could end up being different. I've never had a problem with raccoons. In fact, I don't think I've even seen more than a couple of raccoon uh, on the trail, even at night. So they don't come, they're not raiding parties coming after your food, but they're not there until they are. So I always assume that they're always around in kind of wild areas, especially deeper down the trail, more towards Cumberland. But bear, I'm not worried about. What other wildlife? Man, you're going to see deer. You're going to see all sorts of different types of birds, pileated woodpeckers, beautiful red kind of manes on them. You're going to be seeing a ton of eastern box turtles. You're going to be seeing them all in the canal, sunning themselves on logs. You're going to be seeing uh, fox occasionally. I've seen some fox. Um, Lots of just cool classic mid-Atlantic wildlife. If you're a birder, this is an amazing place. Egrets, uh, 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 great blue herons, lots of different types of birds that you can check out. Um, of course, along with your your uh, uh, typical northeastern slash mid Atlantic birds, really, really amazing in this area. Wildlife, I think, is one of the most fun elements to all of this. Beaver, I've seen beaver before too. Uh, next question: Hey, I thought this trail went to Pittsburgh. It does, and it doesn't. This trail terminates in Cumberland. However, literally, as soon as this trail ends, the Great Allegheny Passage begins. And so you can take a different trail from Cumberland up and over the mountains and then into all the way to Pittsburgh. So you tack on another 150 miles to your adventure. And there you are. Um, That's why many people talk about this trail as the Gap Co, the Great Allegheny Passage slash CNO, or sometimes will mistakenly say that this trail is part of the gap. It is not. It is a separate trail altogether. Um, So if you do want to go to Pittsburgh or you want to be coming from Pittsburgh to DC, yes, these two trails basically act as one, but they have two different personalities. Uh, They have different sets of fans, quite frankly. I think you're either, as I've mentioned on the show, Team C&O or Team Gap. And I've been on Team C&O for a while, which is no disrespect to the gap. Uh, I think it's a fantastic one. And like I said, if you guys are interested in uh, another 
audio uh, guide to the Great Allegheny Passage, let me know. Shoot me an email. I may do it later this winter when I am struggling for content. Last but not least on the FAQs for this particular episode, what's the best way to get to the trailheads? So the first thing I would do is I would direct you to go to the uh, National Park Services site for the Chesapeake and Ohio uh, National Historic Park. That lists every single one of the parking lots all up and down the trail. That can be really helpful if you're going to section ride or section hike this particular trail. Hello, hikers, if you're if you're paying attention to this at all. And um, it also can be helpful for where you might want to ditch your car. You are allowed to park in parks service lots for multiple days while you do a ride. They have a system for that. Uh, last I checked, you print out a, basically a parking permit that essentially just gives them the heads up that you are going to be there. Um, some places that are more rural than others, it you know, it, you, you might not even get questioned whether you have that or not, but I would recommend that you follow whatever rules that they have. A lot of folks will ask about uh, DC versus Cumberland, um, that that might, that might be what they choose for which direction. There's tons of places where you can park in Cumberland that are free. They're underneath the freeway. Um, there are other options as well. Um, you can park in Washington, D.C. as well, although sometimes you'll have to pay for that. I've heard of folks who will uh, park their car at uh, DCA airport and they will end up uh, paying, I think it's now up to, I think it's like $17 a day now. It's not not the cheapest parking that you can get. There are parts in DC where you could park potentially for free, but what we have is neighborhood regional parking, zoned parking. So if you come in with an out-of-state tag, you will be the local um, parking enforcement agent's best friend because they will ticket you every single day. So I would not recommend that. Uh, make sure that you're getting parking in a place where it is legal for you to do it. If you know somebody in the burbs, you uh, you can park at their place. That might be a helpful thing. And you could take mass transit in with your bike. Lots of different potential options there. I know that certain hotels will do kind of a park and ride type of thing where you can park your car with stay a night uh, on either end of your trip. If you fly into DC, be able to park there and keep your, park there the whole, uh, keep your car there the whole time. Lots of different options. Uh, Reddit is full of these types of, of things. So I would definitely recommend taking a look there. But if you are looking at parking in anything other than Cumberland or DC, check out the Park Service Trailheads. I think that can be a really, really helpful resource for you, especially if you want to take advantage of some of the train options as well. One thing that I didn't talk about is Amtrak. Amtrak has a stop in Washington, DC, also in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, which is on right on the other side, a quick little shot over the bridge, and then Cumberland as well. So you can use Amtrak as the beginning, the middle, or end of your rides. I've used Amtrak many, many times. They're excellent. During high season, you are going to have to get a bike reservation very early because there are only a limited number of bike spots in on the Amtrak trains. Some folks will look at the mark, the Maryland uh, uh, commuter rail system as another possibility. If you have a folding bike, you'll be able to do that. But on that particular line, if memory serves, you're not allowed to have a full size bike there. So be mindful that rail rules and bikes check the website of whatever system you're going to be using, because that's going to, that's going to be a good indicator as to whether it's a good idea for you or not. But I love using rail as my beginning, middle, or end of my rides. It's a really helpful way to either do a fast forward or to transport you in one direction or another. And the train ride is gorgeous between the areas. Just note for the record that Amtrak has one train in each direction. And I think they're back to every day now. Um, it is the Capital Limited, and it leaves the D.C. area around 4 o'clock p.m. going towards Cumberland. It gets you there, I want to say, in the 7 o'clock hour if everything goes well. Coming back from Cumberland, if memory serves, it's in the uh, not late morning, but like I would say mid-morning, and gets you into D.C., I believe, by 1 p.m. And that is your only shot for a train uh, in either direction, one train a day each direction. Um, so that can be helpful for your access to the trailheads using ramp. So that's it. Was that every question I've ever been asked? Is that every question that maybe you have? Probably not. If you've got some additional questions, I will answer them in a supplemental FAQ, which will go into next week's show uh, as you are listening to it right now. So shoot them my way, pedalshift at pedalshift.net, and we'll have a supplemental FAQ next week. But also next week, what we're going to do 
is the CNO, as I mentioned, is 184 and a half miles. We're going to break each section down in 10 mile chunks and chat about each section. So we'll do a virtual ride description of each of these 10 mile sections from DC to Cumberland, because that's the way I like to go sometimes. Sometimes I do the other way, but we'll do it DC to Cumberland next week on part two of the audio guide to the CNO. And as always, we like to close out the show with a special shout out to the Pedal Shift Society. Because of support from listeners like you, Pedal Shift is a weekly bicycle touring podcast with a global community, expanding into live shows and covering new tours like this fall's upcoming bike tour. If you like what you hear, you can support the show for five bucks, two bucks, or even a buck a month. And there's one shot and annual options. If you're not to the small monthly thing, check it all out at pedalshift.net slash society onto the society. Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lean, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Keith Nagel, Brock Dittis, Thomas Skada, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Harry Telgatis, Chris Barron, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hipwell, Mr. T, Nathan Poulton, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Cody Florchinger, Tom Beninati, Greg Braithwaite, Sandy Pizio, Jeff Muster, Seth Pollock, Joseph Quinn, Drew Porter, Byron Patterson, Joachim Robert, Ray Jackson, Jeff Fry, Kenny Mikey, Lisa Hart, John Denkler, Steve Hankel, Miguel Quinones, Alejandro Aviles Reyes, Keith Spangler, Greg Towner, Jody Zoranen, Lucas Barwick, Michael Baker, Brian Bechtal, Reinhardt Bigel, Greg Middlemas, Connie Moore, William Gothman, Brian Benton, Joan Churchill, Mike Bender, Rick Weinberg, Billy Crafton, Gary Matushak, Greg Latois Lopez, James Sloan, Jonathan Dillard, John Funk, Ronald Paroli, Dave Roll, Brian Hafner, Misha LeBanc, Ari Messenger, David Grotke, Todd Grossbeck, Wally Estrella, Sue Reinert, John Lico, Stephen Granada, Philip Mueller, Robert Lackey, Dominic Carroll, Jackie McCullough, John Hickman, Carl Presso, David Neves, Patty Louise, Terry Fitzgerald, Peter Steinmetz, Timothy Fitzpatrick, Michael Lazuski, Hank O'Donnell, David Zanoni, David Weil, Matthew Sponsell, Chad Reno, Spartan Dale, Carolyn Ferguson, Peggy Littlefield, Lauren Allen Smith, Eric Burns, Thomas Pearl, Darren McKibben, Richard Stewart, and Dave Fletcher. And thanks also to all past and anonymous folks for helping make this show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available. <laughs> <laughs>